So everyone, welcome You're very much. Um, you're very welcome to our seminar this evening. It's a two-part series. This is part two, which is of our series called Savvy Home Selling. And this part will be covering navigating costs and taxes. So it's the fun part. I'm not sure why if eating pasta is a good idea because we're going to go through a lot of numbers. But you know, you're. Um, I hope that you can enjoy. I always want. I, I always like to feed people and make sure that you have a lot of food and chocolate and, and whatnot to be happy because I think it's important to be happy when we're, when we're doing whatever we're doing. Um, so my name is Jean Joe. For those of you who don't know me, I think most of you do. Um, I'm the broker and owner of Paris and Real Estate, uh, which was founded in 2016. I have a f uh, four agents with me, five agents with me now, two of them in, in the back, Christy and Philip. Um, Paris comes from the Greek word for abundance. And uh, I, abundance and overflow. And when I started the company, I didn't want to be like Jean Joel Realty. I don't think there's anything wrong with people who name it after themselves. But personally, I didn't want to do that. And I, I found this word and I loved it because it has that concept of abundance and overflow. And, you know, really keeping in mind that no matter how hard things are, our lives are so blessed and that we have so much abundance. And so out of that abundance, we can help each other, share with each other and lift each other up. Um, especially when it comes to real estate, sometimes it can be very competitive, but I really um, believe in this concept that, you know, I want to be able to share with others, help educate them and inform. Um, I, you know, our, so our company's vision is really to help our clients, our colleagues and our community so that they can have the information they need to thrive and really feel abundance in their real estate living. So, um, so these seminars we've been doing ever since we started the company and I hope to continue. During COVID, we went webinar, right, online seminar. We still do a majority of our seminars online, but now we've kind of doing a, a co combination because I think some of the in-person is really valuable. We don't get to get as much interaction um, without it. But, um, you know, these seminars, again, are that are an overflow of the uh, principle of abundance and wanting to share. Uh, I invite often my colleagues, agents in my networking group, um, I have one here, and it's always exciting for me to share because I think, you know, if they want to get started on it, you know, I'd love to help them get started on it as well because I think we want to get that information out there and to serve all of our clients. So a quick disclaimer, this seminar is being presented with the intent of providing information uh, to our clients and neighbors, but it's not meant to be construed as specific advice. So um, if you do have a specific situation that you need, please consult your attorney or your tax specialist before you make any decisions. Don't just go, oh, Joe said that at the seminar, or Jean said that at the seminar, so I'm just gonna go, go you know, uh, make my own decisions. Um, it, really, we're trying to give you information, and then if, for your specific cases, um, I would highly recommend that you, you, know, you go and talk to a specialist in that. Uh, so we do have, uh, in terms of an outline, I'm going to start out with a quick market update and then we're going to go through the cost of selling. That part will be pretty much just, I'll be going through that and, and going quickly through what are the costs involved when you're selling a property. And then really the heart of what we're going to do today is uh, Joe Daly, who is my favorite accountant in the world. Um, he is so knowledgeable, has so many great, um, he's, he's so good at explaining what he knows as well, which is not always easy to find. And he seems to be very passionate about taxes. So um, even though he's actually retired, he still comes and uh, is willing to speak at these. And he asked me if I ever need help. And he's willing to come and speak at agent meetings and whatnot because, you know, he, and, and I just love that about him. So he'll be covering uh, taxes when it comes to selling your principal residence, selling investment property, and then a little bit about property taxes because that's gonna, there are going to be some different things involved with that. And then we'll have quick announcements and hopefully get everybody out of here around eight or so. I have the room until nine, but we, we don't need to stay here until nine. Okay. Uh, so as a real estate, first of all, um, I'm just gonna do a quick real estate market update. Uh, the, uh, I like to do different, cover different metrics and uh, metrics and different indicators. And the primary one that you'll often hear is median sale price. Median sale price, when we're talking about that, means that when you have a price, there are the same number of homes that are selling above that price as below it. Okay, that's the simple way of doing it. This chart up here uh, covers median sale price for single family homes in San Mateo County. Uh, and as you can see, that goes all the way back. You can't see it, but you do have the slides actually if you wanna follow along in your folder and take notes. Um, it goes back to 1999. 
And you can see that it, it kind of goes up and down. Um, it goes up and down, and then there is a trough uh, right around um, trough right around the middle. That is 2008. And that's when I started real estate. So I started, and you'll all remember it as the Great Recession. That's when every, nothing was happening. It took me eight months to get my first deal, and it was a little $200,000 condo um, with a, that was a short sale and an FHA loan, and it was super complicated. So that was how I got started. Um, median sale price at that time was hovering around $500,000. So the beginning in 1999 that you see, it's around, right around 500,000, started going up and up. In the early 2000s, we started getting a, a big, uh, you know, it started going up quite significantly, and then there was that drop. And it, at that time, it ended up being close to 500,000, a little bit more than that. Um, since then, since 2012, we've actually seen the prices continuing to go up. Of, of course, there have been the ups and downs along the way, but really consistently, it's gone up. You see that upward trend. Um, and then the red vertical line that you see is COVID lockdown. So you see COVID lockdown, and at the end of that year, or toward the middle of that year, everybody wasn't sure what was gonna happen. Like, are we gonna be able to all live again kind of thing? And so the prices kind of stalled a bit. They didn't drop, they stalled a bit. And then since 2021, there was just a huge up, up peak that went up through, 20, uh, through the beginning of 2022. And so if you look at the chart, you'll see there's a, the, big, the highest peak, that was in April of 2022, and it was at 2.25 million. Just wrap your mind around that. Half the homes sold above 2.25 million, half sold below it, right, in our county. And so that was huge. Toward the middle of, 2000, uh, toward the middle of last year, 2022, we actually saw the prices starting to come down a little bit, and I'll go into why. Um, and then it has come up a little bit more since then. And so now, as of September, the uh, median sale price was at 1.85 million. Not too shabby. It's not 2.25, but I, it's definitely not 500,000. So, um, so quite significant there. Uh, what, is, what is the main reason why? The big dip there, yeah, and I'm going to be talking about that, so <laughs> great. Um, so months of inventory. So what, what impacts our prices? Well, one of the biggest uh, factors has to do with inventory, and I'm sure if you've been reading the news about real estate, you're hearing inventory as well. Um, this is, again, for single-family homes in San Mateo County, and as you can see, right toward the middle, there's that big peak. That's, again, the Great Recession, so we started seeing um, homes, a, a lot of inventory on market. The way that we measure this is a metric called months of inventory. What, what we do with that is you take the number of homes that are currently on the market and then, how, um, and then assume that there are no new, uh, in, there are new houses coming on the market and then you take it at the rate at which they're selling, how long will it take us to run out? Okay, how long will it take us to run out? And so if you get six months of inventory, that's generally considered a balanced market. If you have higher than that, higher than six months of inventory, that's traditionally been considered a buyer's market because you have a lot, it'll take you a long time to sell all of those houses out and you have a lot of inventory and so the buyers have their pick in a way, right? And then if you go below that, that's considered a seller's market. So since 2012, we've been pretty much hovering, if you, I don't know if you can see it on here, but the bottom bar is, um, stands for two months of inventory which is, is it a buyer's market or a seller's market? Seller. Seller's market, right? It's a seller's market. Oh, oh sorry. Sorry, it didn't flip. So thank you. Um, so, it's a, it's, so as you can see here, toward the middle, you see that big peak, again, the Great Recession, and then the vertical line is, again, the COVID lockdown, and we did see a little bit of inventory kind of stalling, but it wasn't a lot just because People were not selling houses, but they also weren't, uh, people weren't buying houses, but they also weren't listing them, right? It was kind of a, a stalemate. So we didn't really see much of a, a big difference. 2021, as I mentioned, we started seeing the prices peaking up. You also see the inventory levels went down. And that went down to here, well, where you'll see that kind of dip, the, the big dip. And we're looking at one month, 0.9 months, 0.8 months, three to four weeks to sell out all the houses that are on the market if nothing ever came in, right? So you can imagine that's what, that would make sense why things started peaking up. Since then, we have seen the inventory levels come up a little bit, but not so much. 
And that's an interesting thing, and I'll go into a little bit more of why. Um, but even then, it's still been hovering right around the two-month mark. So even this month, uh, it, in September, it was at, I think it was 1.2 months of inventory. So it's still, depending on where you are, of course, but, um, but I'm sorry, it was 1.8 months of inventory that we had in September. So our next metric is days to sell. So this is how long does it take when you put a house on the market until you get an accepted offer in place? So how long does it take to do that? And as you can see, during the recession times, right toward the middle of the chart, very long, right? And we're talking about 40 days, 50 days, 60 days. Those were the days of a lot of foreclosures, a lot of short sales uh, and whatnot going on. Um, you see that where the red line is, where COVID lockdown, it drops down to zero. Why does it drop down to zero? It's because during that time when we hit March, I think it was 17th of 2020, nobody could do open houses. We could not show houses. We were not allowed and we didn't really know what was gonna happen. And so our multiple listing service or MLS, as you may have heard, um, actually paused the counter and said, we're just gonna count everything as zero. So even if you put it on now, we're gonna pause it. And it didn't get started up again until May. So, um, and because we weren't sure what was happening, it's not really fair to say something is on the market when nobody can see it, right? And so that was kind of the logic behind it. So you see it dropping. Um, from there though, we did see uh, the, the, the count and that low horizontal is 10 days. So it's been pretty much hovering between 10 and 20 days. There was a little bit of a peak that you see here that was November, December of last, uh, December and last year and January of this year. And why is that? that? That was the question that we had, right? Well, here's a look at interest rates. And uh, so inventory is one that we've been talking about that keeps the prices high. Interest rates will impact the buyers because every, you can consider it every 1% of interest rate change is about a 10%, give or take, depending on what price you're looking at, but you can say roughly 10% of uh, buying power in terms of home prices, right? So, um, so here at the beginning of 2020, 2021, we we're at around 3%. How many here have an, uh, an interest rate that's higher than four? Anybody have a mortgage that's higher than four? Higher than four? Okay, but you're the only one. Most people have refinanced along the way, right? And so the, generally three to 4% you know, is, is about where people are at if they refinance during the low interest rate levels. Well, in the course of 2021, literally um, over the course between March to June, July, we saw the interest rates just jump up, right? So July, we saw a huge peak and we were starting to talk about 5%, 6% interest rates. And that can impact the buyers quite a bit. And so, um, so we, saw, we started seeing where buyers are more nervous and they can't maybe offer as much and their buying power has gone down. So, so that was a big factor. It also impacts sellers because if a seller is thinking to move, if you have a 3% interest rate or 2% for some people interest rate, right? Now, if you were to sell and buy something, you have to give, up, give that up and you're looking at close to, um, this morning I was talking to one of our loan agents, they're, they're quoting in the mid sevens for interest rate. So it's more than doubled for some people, right? So it's, it's a big, big difference for people. And so because of that, it's actually, there's this, what we call a lock-in effect where sellers are also not able to sell because they're, or they, they're able. So if you really need to, you can sell, but if not, you're gonna think twice, right? Before you give up that low mortgage rate. And so we've seen that happening. One thing to keep in mind though, yes. Sure. Sure. So, um, so the question is about the, um, does this include principal residence plus um, the investment property? This is just 30 year fixed rate mortgage average. So I don't, I don't think it covers, I don't think it differentiates between the two, but I'm not sure to, to be honest with you. I think it's probably more principal residence though, because it, from the numbers, it looks more like principal residence. Rest, uh, um, investment property, of course, is gonna be a little bit higher usually, so. Um, and, but it will follow, it did follow the same trend. So it might be like maybe a percent higher, but it'll, it also follows the same trend. But one thing to keep in mind that I like to remind people, interest rates, you gotta think historically, because the chart I showed you earlier was from beginning of 2021. And now if you go back to, um, this chart goes all the way back to 1970, um, 1976. And so if you see that, 
um, there's a big peak that comes up, at, that's 1981, and um, one of my agents, uh, Philip, who's here, actually uh, bought his house in 1981, and your interest rate was 18, 18.75%. Just, you know, so, and he still bought his house. Granted, the prices were much lower then, right? So that, that makes sense, but in a historical perspective, you know, the, the interest rates have been, um, have been higher, and if you take that picture that I gave you from here to here, it's, it is a big jump within a year, but it's not so bad that it'll, it'll be restrictive for people to buy. So, so that's kind of the, the uh, gist of what's going on in the field. I always like to talk about what's happening in the field, and as I go into the next section, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but we are seeing homes that are in good locations, in good condition, selling fast. So I'm still seeing, you know, we're still hearing of, you know, six offers, 10 offers, three offers, you know, maybe not as much, but still selling well. At the same time, we are seeing buyers that are becoming much more selective because, and so if it's not as good of a location or if the condition is, if it's not ready to move in and they have to think about putting work in, they're a little less inclined to do that just because on top of everything else, the costs of repair and construction and materials has gone up as well. So um, people are a little shy about that and they're also spending more money because the prices are still pretty high. Remember 1.85 uh, for September as a median sale price and the interest rates are high. So they might be thinking, okay, um, I think what's helped is that more and more buyers are getting savvy to it. They're not looking to wait until it goes back down to two or 3%. They're going, okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and what we say, marry the home and date the rate. So you, you're gonna go long-term when you think about the home and what you wanna buy. And then for the interest rate, we're not gonna worry about the fact that it's seven or eight, even 8% 8 now, because we're hoping to be able to refinance in a year or two. So that's kind of where we're going, but um, definitely seeing uh, buyers being a little bit more selective. So uh, cost of selling, I'm gonna go quickly through this because I really wanna give Joe most of the time, but um, in terms of preparation, um, we did do part one uh, of this is, was online, and so we do have a video of it uh, in terms of all the different preparation that you need to do to prepare a home for sale. Here's just a, and you'll have it in your notes as well, just kind of to go through quickly uh, the types of things that you could have to pay. So one of the things obviously is repairs and improvements, and that can vary depending on what you're gonna do. And I'm not gonna go into all the detail of that because I actually do that in part one. And also um, that I would say, it really depends. It's important for you if you're thinking about selling, you know, call a real, your trusted real estate advisor. Um, I would love to do that for you if possible, but you know, if you have somebody, call them, have them do a walkthrough and take you through what they recommend that you should do. Don't just go ahead and start remodeling like crazy because that's not necessarily gonna give you the best return for your money. So that cost will vary. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my first chart here. So that's repairs and improvements, that cost will vary. Um, then there may be a sewer lateral inspection and repair cost that may be, may, may be involved. Um, many of the cities in the Bay Area are enacting, and it's not every single one, so again, you need to uh, consult your real estate advisor, uh, but many of the com com uh, cities in the county and in the Bay Area as a whole now have what they call a point of sale uh, where when you're selling a home, it's required that you get your sewer lateral inspected. The sewer lateral is basically what goes from your sewer line from your house all the way up to the city line. And so you are required to have that inspected and almost all of the homes that I've ever done one on have not passed because most of the homes in the area, you know, if you're built in the 50s or 60s or young or even later, I mean, even new, um, older, right? The, that line is, is gonna be very old. In South San Francisco, uh, there, most of the homes there have what's called Orangeburg, which is almost, and a plumber told me, that's basically like taking a bunch of cardboard and compressing it, right? So imagine water going through that for decades. And so it's, and then you also have trees that will love to you know, find sources of water. And so that can happen if you need to have it repaired, the cost can vary. Um, I've generally seen them more around five to 10,000, but I have heard of some cases where uh, there were two houses sharing the same line, they had to dig up both and all of that, and it was, uh, went up to 25,000. So just depends on how that goes. Um, 
Staging, uh, and I'm kind of going in different orders, but staging is one that is highly recommended, and I do talk about that in part one of the series. Um, but that can cost uh, anywhere from 2,500 is the minimum, and that's for like a small one bedroom condo type situation. And then it can go up to 7,000. If you have a huge home, luxury home, and you want the big furniture, it'll, it'll go higher than that. But in general, the, the standard homes that I've seen, it's usually about five to 6,000, somewhere thereabouts. You can almost calculate it as about $2 per square foot. It's not exact, but that'll help. If you have stairs, that can make a difference. So um, all of that there. Um, inspections, so the primary ones that we recommend are property and termite inspections. Those run anywhere from about $800 to $1,200. If you have a, a smaller home, it'll be less. If you have a bigger home, it would be more. Um, but the inspections are something that we do highly recommend and we do talk about in the other video. And then there could be other required point of sale, um, other point of sale requirements that might be out there. Um, Millbrae, for instance, has a chimney spark arrestor that you have to check on. And that's not expensive to do, but you do need to check it and have it taken care of. Uh, there are some in, in San Francisco, there is an energy and water conservation inspection that you need to, be get, to get done. So every look, look, uh, city has different requirements. And now a big one that we've been seeing is also if you're in an area where it's a high fire hazard zone, there, that's also something to consider. If you have a wood roof, that's something to be careful for because the insurance companies don't want to insure those homes anymore. And so that's becoming an issue for buyers trying to get insurance. If you have older electrical, there's a lot of different things. So again, I would just have, you know, talk to somebody, a specialist who can help you, um, guide you through that. But this is just to give you a general idea of the costs. So here's an example of a three bedroom, two bath home. And I'm not going to go through all the costs here, but that's, this is a little bit on the high side, but, um, but general, it's just to give you a general idea of like how much you can expect so that, um, and then you can sometimes get a good deal if you have a friend and if you're willing to go pick up all the materials, you can probably do it for much cheaper. Um, if you're gonna go higher end, it'll be more expensive. But this, is, this chart here is just to give you a, a, an idea of some of the common things that we do, like painting and floors. Painting and floors are huge. So if you can do that, take a look at, if you go back home, look at the paint, look at your floors, see what kind of condition they're in. Uh, definitely carpet is not as uh, attractive to people nowadays as the hard surface flooring. Also, if people have allergies, there's that, but it's also a trend. I think there was a time when carpet was in and people wanted the carpet, but nowadays more people are looking for that. And on, on this chart, you'll see HW is hardwood floors. So if you have hardwood floors and just refinish them, or um, LVP is luxury vinyl plank flooring. So that is something that's been kind of in and trendy. It's waterproof. It's a lot easier to maintain. Um, and then things like replacing light fixtures, door hardware, um, those are some of the easy things that you can do to update a home. Um, and then besides the repair, uh, preparation costs, there are closing costs here. So we have uh, your loan payoff, if, it, if you have a mortgage already, then that has to be taken out of it. Uh, there are drawing, notary, and recording fees, so that'll be about $250 to $500. Uh, and then broker fees, which are what you pay your agent, and that's negotiable. Um, county transfer tax, in San Mateo County, it's $1.10 per thousand. So if it's $100,000, just 100 times 110. So it'll be, I uh, shouldn't do math up here. So in any case, it's $1.10 per thousand. City transfer tax. The only city in San Mateo County that has a transfer tax, or there are two, are San Mateo, City of San Mateo and Hillsboro. So those will come into play. And then we have more closing costs, natural hazards disclosure, which is a report that um, the, the sellers are required to do natural disclosure on the environment in the area. And you're not specialists, so it's good to, or I'm not a specialist, so it's good to use a third party company. They generally, it's not expensive, it's $99 or $125. A home warranty, if you're gonna be paying for that, that's not, um, it doesn't have to, you don't have to necessarily. And if there are any HOA fees, if you're living in a condo, there could be transfer fees, there could be move out fees. So that might, um, if that applies, that might be there. And then um, your property taxes, it'll be prorated, and that'll depend on how that goes. So, um, and then for California withholding, that's if you have, um, if it's an investment property, there will be a three and a third percent that they will withhold, so that you'll need to pay. So that's something that sometimes in people who are selling their investment property don't think about that, and they're like, wait, what is this charge? You know, why is the why is the um, 
California getting $20,000 on my sale. That's what, that's what that's for. So in your uh, folders, and I'm, I'm going to uh, pass it on, in your folders there's an estimated seller proceeds. I'm not going to go through this form, but it basically does kind of an example of what you can expect for a sale. I put in a $1.8 million sale price. So you can just take a look at that, and then um, if you would like at any time to you know, have, have me or Philip or Christy or your agent, you can always ask for, it's called the estimated seller proceeds, and they can go through and tell you, well, assuming that we sell, sell for this amount, what's your loan amount, what are your property taxes, and, and et cetera, um, they'll be able to calculate that out for you so that you know what you can expect. Okay. So that's the um, estimated seller statement in there. All right, so selling your principal residence. So the first thing we need to do is, and, and, and I know this sounds uh, simple, but we still talk about it. Well, how do we define a principal residence? I, I think if someone asks you, well, you know, where do you live? I think that's our first clue that that's your principal residence, okay? But there are other ways to determine that. So. And it doesn't normally come up unless you have different residences, like in different states uh, and, and such. But generally, when you buy a home, uh, early on, the county that you bought the home from will send you a form, a homeowner's exemption form. And you fill it out and say, yes, uh, we are living in this property, or no, this was intended to be a rental property, so we're not living in the property. The intent of that is to give uh, the homeowner who lives in the property, as opposed to has it for investment, a little bit of a reduction of the assessed value. I believe it's seven thousand. Yeah. So that what does that save you on a year? Seven bucks or seventy dollars or something? Something very small, but it's something. But what it also does is it establishes that that's your principal residence. So if it comes up later, that's one way to uh, to also look at it. Um, let me see here. Yeah, so I've had situations where a client wanted to actually make sure that the county knew that they lived in a property or, or that it was no longer their principal residence because they had moved out of state. And then, uh, you know, so, so, they did, so they signed the thing that they didn't have a, that wasn't their principal residence because they were, uh, they were like, a, they wanted to be a Hawaii resident to save money for taxes. But then they wanted to come back uh, and live here long enough in order to sell their home and take the $500,000 exclusion that we'll talk about in a little bit. So my suggestion to them was that they immediately send a letter to the county that they lived in and let them know that they, in fact, were back in, in the house and it was their principal residence and that they should get the homeowner exemption. So that to them was, was very important because they were trying to then reestablish California residents long enough to get that exemption. Okay, so that, those are just a couple of ways, but normally you know, where you live is where your residence is. And, and then you have a lot of other little things that come along, like for instance, and, and this isn't big, but it's, it's still something how this comes up. So my son lives in New York, but guess what? I do his taxes, right? So we use our home address as his tax address. And that's another way to establish your principal residence is where do you, you know, when you file your taxes, where do you show them your residence being, your address? So anyway, we use our address. So every year he gets a letter from the state of California wondering why he didn't file a tax return because he obviously lives in the state. So then I, I send back a little note to them saying, no, no, he is a New York resident. I'm his accountant. We use our uh, address for tax purposes only because if he ever got a notice and he was in New York, I'd never know about it. So I, I need to have our address on his tax return. So, so it comes up in a lot of different ways that you would never think about, but there are consequences to those things. Okay. Was that? Okay, so the question was for the people who, who uh, left California, bought a place in Hawaii, and now they were coming back to California, uh, how long does it take to, uh, to reestablish California residents? Well, 
there, there is no law, right, to the point. So my advice to them was the older, the colder. The longer you wait to sell your home, the more effective it is. So it, in fact, the letter that they had stated, because they were moving, they were coming back and forth to California to clean up their home and everything. So I, I think they actually picked the, the first day that they spent a good bit of time here in California. So it was like four or five months ago. And then I think they were gonna be going into, and that would have been like March. And they were going into escrow sometime, probably in October, November. So they're probably selling the house now. I don't do their taxes, I, they're just a relative, so I'm just giving advice to them. So, so there is no established, and a, yeah, because they, they actually were only in Hawaii like a year. Before that, they lived in California for four years. So they definitely, they definitely meet the two out of five year rule. They definitely meet the on title rule, but it was the definition of principal residence that was probably most at, at risk there. So, so we're just trying our best to kind of go through it and, and establish. Okay, so, and again, it's a great segue into the next, the next slide. And that is why would they wanna go through uh, this whole thing with the letters and the homeowner exemption and the, the reason why is because when you sell your principal residence, um, uh, you get, each person gets a $250,000 capital gain exclusion. All right, so there are two, two things you need to pass. The first one is you have to be on title on the house at least the last two years, okay? And you have to have lived in the house two out of the last five years. So, so you might, uh, so in this case, if they were uh, in Hawaii for, for uh, you know, two years and 10 months, they could still meet the two out of five year rule. Because the other way to say it is if you're out more than three years, then you've lost your potential exemption. So, so let, let's just say you have a, a person, and we'll get into this, but a person who bought a house as a single person and then uh, married somebody and now the spouse is there and the spouse has lived in the property many years, but he's not on title. That spouse is still entitled to a $250,000 capital gain exemption by virtue of the fact that his spouse was on title of the property. So only one of the spouses needs to meet the, two, uh, the, the title rule, but both individually have to meet the two out of the last five years. I had an interesting situation come up some years ago. Um, a gal who I really like, really, really nice gal, always very energetic. And she called me one day and she said, I'm getting married. And I was very excited for her. And she told me all about it. And, and uh, she had bought her house as a single person and the guy had moved in with her a couple of years earlier and they were finally getting married. Uh, she was in her 50s, uh, her, kids, her kids had moved out. And, and I said, well, tell me, because tell me, I, I figured something was off. So I said, tell me what's going on with the house. She goes, well, um, we're putting the house up for sale. You know, in a couple of weeks, we're getting it ready, painting it, whatever. And I said, oh, that's great. I said. Uh, and um, when are you planning on getting married? And she said, oh, we're gonna get married in November. And I said, well, you realize that he, your spouse-to-be does not get a $250,000 exemption because on the day the house sells, if she's not married, he's not entitled to it. So she said, well, how do I get around this? I said, well, okay, this is what I would do. I would quietly go down to the justice of the peace have him marry you legally. Don't tell your friends. Have your, have your, have your way, right? I mean, it's legal, it's this the way to do it. She was not happy about that advice. Um, and um, and, and I, she goes, well, does that, mean, does that mean that you can't do my taxes? I said, I can certainly do your taxes. But if, you, if this is the scenario we're looking at, I'm not signing them because that's not right. I'm telling you, you're doing the wrong thing and I'm telling you the way around it. You may not like it, but that's just the way it is. 
and she had a large capital gain on her house. So that other $250,000 at say a combined 33% tax rate, that's another $83,000. So needless to say, I, that was our last conversation, which is fine with me because that's, that's, the, that's the right way to do it. That makes sense? All right, okay. So, all right, next slide. I like this, it's like power, you know? Yeah, it's great. Okay, so that's, and then, and then when it comes to the, the two-year rule, there are specific um, things that, that can happen where the IRS uh, bends that rule a little bit. In fact, they bend it a lot. So, so let's just say that, and, and the classic case is this. If you have special circumstances in your life that cause you to have to sell the property prior to living in it two years, um, the IRS will exonerate you. For instance, the classic case is the person who buys uh, a second story condo. So he's on the second floor of the condo and it's a walk up, there's no, uh, no elevators. And then God bless him, that person gets in an accident and can no longer climb those steps because they're incapable of doing so. Well, the IRS isn't gonna make that person stay for two years and struggle up those stairs in order to get the $250,000 exemption. They're going to allow that person to sell that property and what they do is they prorate that $250,000 exclusion over the months that he actually did live in the property. So let's just say he lived a year before the accident. So in this case, he would get $125,000 of capital gain exclusion. It's not the whole thing, but if he lived in, if he bought the house a year before, right, chances are the $125,000 exclusion, depending on where you're living, might actually cover that particular capital gain. I mean, if he, if he has a problem because the gain is much higher, God bless him because that means he, he picked the right place. Okay. Um, and, and, and I had a situation years ago where we, we had a situation where an elderly gentleman, uh, his wife had passed away, they were clients of mine, and lo and behold, he finds a girlfriend. And the girlfriend's well, maybe 20 years younger than he is. So they buy a house and he buys it in his name only. And, uh, and then she has this bug that she wants to go to Florida and be around her kids and her friends, which is great. I mean, you know, they could do whatever they want. So she coaxes him into selling the property. Well, it turns out later that we find out she just wanted the proceeds, okay? So, so he sold the property and then uh, he came to see me, this is like in the summertime, so he comes to see me the next year and he explains it to me and I said, you did what? So, so he had probably, you know, again, about 100 plus thousand dollar capital gain on the property, but he hadn't lived in two years. So I, I wrote up a nice essay to the IRS and I uh, included it with the tax return, letting them know that this was a classic case of elder abuse and that he was not in his right mind when this whole thing took place and the IRS decided not to challenge it. So there are special circumstances and those are just a couple of them, but, but there are special circumstances where you don't need the whole two years. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Wow. Okay. Uh, that's okay. So she'll be back in just a minute. But we're going we're gonna to go on to uh, once, once you decide to sell your house and you sell your house and you have your closing escrow statement. The closing escrow statement is, is a great document because it has all the numbers. And we all love numbers, right? And the biggest number on there usually is the sale price or the purchase price, whichever way you're looking. Okay, so now you decide to sell your house. Let's figure out what your capital gain is. So the net sales price, we'll wait to go to the, uh, yeah, okay, good. Net sales price is the gross price that's on the, uh, the, the closing escrow statement minus the deductible closing costs. Okay, I say deductible closing costs because not all closing costs are deductible. For instance, if you have prorated property taxes in there, 
Those are not actually closing costs for purposes of capital gain. Those are an itemized deduction on your Schedule A. Okay, if you have, uh, um, there might be other, other things in there, I'm trying, to rem trying to think of what they would be, that they're not always deductible. Uh, credits to buyers are certainly all the costs that Gene was talking about. Those are all uh, those are all relative closing costs, and they're relevant and they're deductible. Certainly, the uh, the county transfer taxes are closing costs. So you got two kinds of taxes: property taxes and and, and uh, the the county transfer tax. Transfer taxes are deductible closing costs. Property taxes prorated are not. Okay, so, so net sale price is the gross sales price less the closing cost. Okay, so your net sale price minus your cost basis, and we'll get into cost basis in a little bit. Cost basis is what skin you have in the house, what money you've put up, what improvements you've made, all those kinds of things. So net sale price minus, minus your cost basis is your net gain. Okay, now the net gain, that's the third one, minus any applicable capital gain exemption, which is what we talked about a minute ago, the $250, $250,000 per person, that then gives you one minus the other, gives you your net taxable gain. That's going to be subject to income tax. So gross sales price minus deductible closing costs minus cost basis equals your, your net capital gain. Now, somewhere in there, you might have depreciation. We'll get into that later. Uh, but that's generally the formula for figuring out what your, what your net taxable gain is subject to income tax. Okay, next. Thank you. Okay, determining cost basis. This has always been the, the most difficult thing uh, for people, including myself. Uh, it's, it's just a hard concept, so, so let's, let's kind of run through it. Where does cost basis start? It's, generally speaking, it starts when you buy the property. When you buy the property, you, you, you have, again, your wonderful closing escrow statement. It says a purchase price. That's the beginning of your cost basis. Then you have all of your, again, relevant closing costs on the purchase of that property, those are additions to the cost basis, okay? Now, from there, we have, uh, so it's, you have an addition to that, you have eligible improvements, and then you have uh, eligible costs of refinance. And, and let me talk about the refinance uh, for a little bit. So some, some accountants shy away from uh, the costs of refinancing as being part of your cost basis. I'm not sure why, and I'm sure the IRS would probably agree with them because they don't want anything to be part of cost basis. But my feeling is a refinance is an extension of the purchase. All you're trying to do is renegotiate to get a better interest rate and, and better terms. So I include, I've always included the costs of refinancing, the relevant deductible costs as part of the cost basis. And then, so, so it's purchase price plus, plus, uh, in, plus um, your closing costs, plus improvements, plus closing costs for refinancing, and then less depreciation. So if the property has been rented somewhere along the way, you have to reduce your cost by, basis by depreciation. And uh, some of you might have uh, an office in the home that you take. And as part of that office in the home, you have depreciation as one of your expenses. Okay, if that's the case, that depreciation needs to be needs to reduce your cost basis. Okay, that's it. Yes. I heard that uh, some part of the refinance cost is deductible. Right. And some are not. Correct. Okay, so uh, sure, she's saying on a refi, some some costs are deductible, some costs are not. Okay, that's what you're asking. Okay, and, and they're asking me to define. So let's go back to a purchase. When you purchase uh, when you purchase a home, 
one of your biggest costs in purchasing uh, are points. Points are loan origination fees, call it whatever you will, they're points. Points on, a, on an original purchase of a principal residence are completely deductible in year one, okay? Points on a refinance are not deductible right away. They are amortized over the life of the loan. So if you, have, uh, if you buy a house in 2000 and you refinance it and, and you get another loan in 2002 uh, and, and then three years later the rates go down so you refinance it again and you pay points again, the points that you paid on your first refi are now completely deductible in that year. And now you have a new set of points, okay? Now, that's just the points. Aside from the points, generally speaking, the, the expenses on a refi are almost identical to the expenses for uh, an original purchase. You're going to have an escrow fee. You're gonna have the signing fee. You're gonna have all of the stuff that you didn't even know existed. You know, I look at those escrow statements and going, they're making this stuff up. They're making up these categories, $50 here, $100 here. You know, the one I always look for, and it's the biggest one, is title insurance. So depending on which kind of insurance you have for title insurance, it's usually Alta or something else. There's usually sometimes a couple of them. Those are all, <coughs> those are not deductible, but they're all closing costs that get added to basis. And they're deductible eventually when you, when you have an outright sale of the property. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Sort of. Okay. Okay, let's, let's go on. What, what where, where, uh, what? Yeah. It, so you're saying there's, a co there's more than one title insurance usually. I yeah. have seen it. Okay. Right, I have two. It, it's part of the closing costs. It, it is part of the closing Yes, it is. Yeah, and, and it's not deductible immediately. It's added to the cost basis and later deducted when you're figuring out how much capital gain you have, okay? We're talking about a principal residence now. On a rental property, it's completely different. But on a principal residence, closing costs are added to cost basis of the property. They're not deducted immediately. The only things that are deducted immediately are like property taxes that you're paying in, as part of the, uh, the refi. Sometimes they'll make you pay you know, the property tax that's coming up, or they make you pay a year's worth of uh, homeowner's insurance. That's deductible uh, you know, in terms of if it's a rental property, it's not deductible if it's a principal residence. But if you have a home office, part of that insurance might be deductible. Okay? Yeah. All right. Yeah. See, the, cost, uh, the points when you do the refinance, I, I heard you say that should be prorated. It's not deductible. The points. To Correct. The cost base is all you, you have to prorate it. Sure. Okay. So here we go. So on a refinance, let's say you pay $1,000 in points. Okay? You're able to amortize those points over the 30 years with the 30-year loan. So you start to amortize them. And let's just say in year... You amortize 30 years? Yeah, over 30 years. Oh, yeah, it might be 10 bucks a year. <laughs> but, but you're able to do it. So let's just say in year five, you sell the property. The, the remaining unamortized points are then added to cost basis, which then reduce your capital gain but at least you get a little bit of deduction along the way, okay? And if you refi a second time and have points again, again, the first one is wiped out. You, you, so I've had it where I have, you know, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000 in points. If they refinance two, three years later, we get a nice chunk of deduction we weren't expecting except for the, except for the refi. So you refi again and you get those points deducted. Okay, eligible improvements. So, and we have a list of them on the, on the next slide, but let's, so I wanna introduce you to a concept that I've over the years have, have espoused and it's this. 
I think anybody who owns a home, whether it's a rental or a principal residence, should have what I call a living document, a spreadsheet of sorts. So the first line of that will be the purchase price. The second line will be the closing costs. And then from there on, anytime you make improvements to the property, I would add a new line, you know, what the improvement is, who you paid, what the date was, uh, and, and, the, and the amount, okay? Now, what goes in there? Of, of course, you're gonna have major repairs. You're going to have, uh, um, you're gonna have re, uh, remodels. You're gonna have huge landscaping. You're gonna have uh, uh, foundation problem, you know, issues where you're gonna have those costs. Okay, so for IRS purposes, when it comes to rental property, they define an improvement as something that you spend for your property that will generally last more than one year, okay? So fixtures, all these little things. So to me, this living spreadsheet is gonna be pretty full. And I suspect that there are gonna be a lot of entries that your accountant, years later when they're looking at this, are gonna just take out because they say it's too small or for whatever reason in their judgment, they don't classify them as improvements. But I say to you, put them on the spreadsheet and let that person be the one to judge whether they're in or not. Because if he says, okay, those are fine, you have additional cost basis and, and you're saving all these receipts as it goes by. So, um, so for me, uh, I, 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 I didn't do this for my home and I've been in there since 1989, the day after the quake, we bought our property closed. Lucky us. So, but here's, here's what I tell people to do. While you're still living in the property, if you want to get the spreadsheet going, stand in the doorway of each room and look at, the, look at that room and say, what's different now than when I bought this property? Oh my gosh, I put hardwood floors in. I, I put brand new windows in. Uh, obviously painting, if it's a, on a large scale, yes. If it's not, don't worry about it. Um, uh, I put the, the things on top. What do you call the, 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 yeah, all that kind of stuff. If you look at a room and, and you're, you know, you have an idea of what you did, start writing this stuff down. It, give it an approximate date of when it happened. Give it an approximate cost of what it is. Putting something down is a lot better than not putting anything down. So at least give yourself a fighting chance at adding those things to cost basis. And then from now on, as you make these little improvements, you know, appliances, uh, uh, like I say, remodels, whatever, uh, start adding them into your, your, sp your spreadsheet. Now, I will say that if you do the same improvement twice, only take the second one, but, but first put it in there. You can, you can wipe it out later. So if you remodel the same bathroom a second time, just put the second one in because you're not going to get them both, okay? Now, so this living spreadsheet serves a few purposes. The first one is when you go to sell your property, you'll have a document showing what your cost basis is and you'll have kept those receipts. And you can even have as, as the lines on a spreadsheet, like an Excel spreadsheet, they have numbers on those lines. So you can actually put on the, on the receipt the number that corresponds to the line on the spreadsheet, okay? Now, the second thing that it does is if you decide later on that you wanna move to Idaho, but you wanna sell your prop, you wanna rent your property out, well, your accountant is gonna need that same spreadsheet to figure out your cost basis to set up your depreciation schedule when you go to rent it out. So it serves both purposes. And a third purpose would be identifying time and place if a specific item comes up. For instance, um, Gene was talking earlier about sewer lateral. I, I am now an expert on sewer laterals because every house I ever get associated with, we have to change it. I mean, we had a, a one in Alameda a couple of years ago. We got, Gene and I are working on another one in Alameda now. We had one, you know, all over the place. 
So if you have this living spreadsheet, you can go to the spreadsheet and say, oh, on, on May 13th uh, of 2013, we did the sewer lateral, we paid uh, XYZ company for doing it. It's receipt uh, number 16 over here. So we go to our receipt 16. We have all the information we need to prove to a buyer, to the city, that we have the sewer lateral all done. So it's really, and, and, it, and you feel like an expert. You don't, you don't feel like, you know, wow, how am I gonna, how am I gonna figure out cost base of the house? You know? and, and so what's gonna happen is the IRS wants you to be lazy and unknowledgeable so that the capital gain will be that much more. Okay, so I'm trying to give you some ideas about how not to fall into that. Okay, let's see. Okay, eligible improvements. And we, again, we've talked about this major repairs and such. Uh, and the other one that we haven't talked about yet is when you're going to sell your house, as Gene spoke about you know, just a little bit ago, um, you might decide with your agent that there are certain things that if done to the house before you put it on the market, you'll get more than what you put into it. So in other words, you, you might change the floors and you might paint a, you know, a room and that might cost you $20,000. But in the judgment of the agent and the market, you might get 100,000 more for making those improvements or even 50. So those, expenses that come up right before you sell your house are also additions and improvements that will increase your cost basis. Does that make sense? All right. Next. Yeah, yes. What's the reason of the multiple replacements that you can only include the last replacement? Say, for example, if a house we own for 40 years. Right. Yeah, classic. But, but uh, why can't you include both uh, roof replacement as your cost basis? What's the logic? Um, I don't exactly know the logic. I know that uh, I know that in an audit situation, that's just an, a, a non-starter with IRS. Uh, and I'm not afraid to, to go against the IRS and talk to them about this. But all, but in my experience. I have, even with other CPAs, we, we pretty much al across the boards feel the same way. Yeah. That, yeah. So I think. That I, legitimate cost basis, oh, right? I totally get it. Totally legitimate, yeah. Uh, but but I, I just think that in some ways we're trying to protect our client from, a, from having an issue. Um, and again, I'm not. I have no problem with, with audits and IRS. I just think that the smart thing to do is to just take you know, the last one that you did. It's usually the most expensive one, by the way, you know, as, as costs go up. Um, all right, so there's different ways that you can acquire property. We've talked about you know, the simplest way, which is you buy the property. But, but uh, this slide in the next... Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. You can just keep talking. Yeah, okay. So th there's, there's two other ways you can acquire property. One is gifted and one is inherited. So I, I know it's basic, but let's go through them. A, gi a, a gifted property is property that's given to you by somebody who is alive at the time the gift was made. Okay? Uh, an inherited property is a property that you acquire from somebody who is, has passed away. So you've got, and you've got two very different situations with regard to cost basis, whether it's gifted or whether it's, it's uh, inherited. So with gifted, pro and, this, and by the way, all this discussion came up heavily when it came to Prop 19, because that's what Prop 19 is all, all about, which is, kind of really messing up a lot of the, uh, of the work that we've done over the years in terms of the state planning. Okay, so for gifted property, when somebody gives you a property, um, they, they step into the shoes of the one who gives it. So in other words, if a parent gives a child a property while they're living, 
the cost basis for the child is exactly the cost basis that the parent had, okay? Um, I, I say that generally, it's usually always the case. In, in a situation where uh, the value of the property is lower than the parent's cost basis, you need to take the lower amount. So you'll have a lower cost basis for loss purposes and the original cost basis for gain purposes. And if it's somewhere in the middle, there's no gain or loss. But just, just in a general rule, it's gonna be the same cost basis that the parents have. So like, uh, you know, when Prop 19, Prop 19 came through, you had a situation where ag against all logic, people were gifting property uh, to their children before, I believe it was February 15th of like 2021, right? Yeah, because by doing that, the kids received not only the lower cost basis that the parents had, but they received the lower tax assessment. And to the parents, it made a lot more sense to gift the property then and allow their children to have lower, uh, the lower assessed value for property taxes then wait until they passed away for their kids to then inherit the property because at that point the kids would have been reassessed up to 100% unless it was a principal residence. Then you get a little bit of a, of a, of a uh, you know, break there. Okay, so that's gifted property. Now, with inherited property, this is where the fun starts. Okay, so if you inherit a property from a parent who is the 100% owner of that property, then that property gets a full step up in basis. What does that mean? That means that uh, an appraiser comes out and appraises that house at the date of death value, and that's the value that the recipient of that particular inherited property, that's the value they use for capital gain purposes in the future, for depreciation purposes in the future. That's now their cost basis. All the, all the uh, uh, capital gains, all the depreciation that the parents might have taken, uh, that's all wiped away and, the kid get, and that person gets a new start. The other thing to consider is this, and, and people miss it all the time, I think, um, that let's just say that in the four or five years before that person passed away, they were really excited about making a bunch of improvements. So they, they remodeled everything. They put in skylights, they put in solar. They did all this stuff to their house, okay? Well, if the, if the recipient's getting a step up in basis, all those things, it doesn't matter. All, they, all they're getting is the value that the appraiser gives to them. So, I would say to you, if you're ever in that situation, I would be quite aggressive with that appraiser to let him know all of the things that differentiate this house from houses around of all the things that were done to this house um, because they may just look at comps, take a few pictures and call it a day. You want them to give you <laughs> two-edged sword. You would want to give, the, you want them to give you the highest cost basis possible in that home so that later on when you sell that property or if you're going to rent it, you, 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 you know, you'll get a higher cost basis for depreciation purposes. Now, here's the other edge of the sword. The other edge of the sword is if the appraiser gives you an appraisal $100,000 higher because of all these improvements, guess what? The county might also say, sounds good to us. So your assessed value will be higher and so will your property taxes. Okay, so depending on how long you decide to keep that property, because I think what's gonna happen now is a lot, of, a lot of kids who inherit properties from their parents, they're just not gonna, they're gonna choke on those property taxes, you know, compared to what their parents had. And they're gonna end up selling those properties. Hopefully they'll kind of work through it. And, and maybe at the end, Gene, you can talk to what's going on now with the, state, with the, the uh, potential ballot measure regarding that, okay? But so, so that's, that's for inherited property where the person who passed away owns 100%. Now, does anybody here have a living trust? Okay, 
Most living trusts have, have a, uh, one of the clauses in there, if you're a married person, is that when the first spouse passes away, the second, you, you know, you're able to, depending on the size of the estate, obviously, you split up the estate into two. You've got the A trust and the B trust. The A is for the person above, that's the, the surviving spouse. The B is for the person below, okay? It's the, you can call it a decedent's trust, uh, a, an exemption trust, whatever it is. But what happens is, is sometimes they'll take the properties, including the residence, um, and they'll put half of the residence in the decedent's trust and half of the residence in the surviving spouse's trust, okay? And then the surviving spouse passes away. Well, if they're 50-50, only the one half that the surviving spouse has in their own trust gets a step up in basis. The decedent's trust got a step up in basis at the first death. So if you inherit that property, you're gonna have a mixed bag. You're gonna have a, you're gonna have a 100% step up on the 50% that's owned, owned, and you're gonna have no step up on the other part that's owned. So if that's the situation, uh, uh, in, in your, your, with your living trust or your, you've inherited property in, with, with those parameters, you need to work with your accountant and your attorney to figure out what the proper cost basis is. It's just not so easy to figure out. Um, yes, and again, I, as I said before, we've had situations, so, so let's just say you bought a house in, in 2006 at, the, at kind of the peak of the market. And all of a sudden, you know, somebody, pa the person passed away, person passed away and you inherited the property in, in early 2009. Guess what? That property might actually have stepped down in value because it's gone down in value. Okay? So, and again, it gets appraised and that's the value you get. So if it's gone down in value, that's the, that's the, uh, the basis that you have going forward. When you, uh, when you sell real estate, the state of California is always wanting uh, to um, go ahead and take some of the tax up front. Uh, it's usually paid in escrow. You'll see a nice line that says Franchise Tax Board. It's usually 3.33% of the gross proceeds. I should, yeah, of, of, no, the sale price, not the gross proceeds, sale price. However, when you're, there are some exempt transactions to this. The biggest one is uh, if, you, if this is your sale of your principal residence. So if it's a sale of principal residence, even though you might have a massive gain for California purposes after the $500,000 exclusion, California, the, the title company generally does not, and California doesn't ask for any kind of upfront payment, okay? Now, I still think you should compute the gain and uh, either make an estimate of that gain and pay it in, or at least put the money aside. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of instances where uh, property was sold, the money was put in the market, and um, you know money was not put aside, and now the markets, with the markets gone down, especially the crypto markets, you might not have enough money to pay the tax because it wasn't put away or wasn't paid as an estimate, you know? And it's just one of those things. So an interesting thing has come up over the last, you know, with interest rates going up, uh, what's come up is this. So if somebody sells a property and they're really not sure what they're gonna do with the funds, with the money, they have no, you know, they might be just thinking, okay, I'm just going to put it in a, a CD. And as you know, CDs now are not too bad because rates are, interest rates are up. But, but in general, interest, you know, CDs were 1%, 1.5%. So this brings up an opportunity for some people uh, to, to make their house more saleable if the market's not doing so well and, and taking back financing. What does this mean? This means that uh, you sell your house and you're, you're the bank, or you might be the bank for part of it. So let's just say that you, you have a, a buyer who'd love to buy your house, 
but they go in and they don't qualify for the loan because of whatever parameters the bank has regarding financing. And, but they have, you know, they have their 30, 40% down of cash borrowed from their parents or given to them by their parents. So in that situation, you might say, okay, I'm selling a million dollar house. They're putting down $400,000. I can, I can maybe ask them for a, uh, I can maybe give them a $600,000 loan, which is the rest of the property and, uh, and get 5% over maybe a five or 10 year period, who knows? Okay, so what does that do? And you say, well, you know, is it risky? Okay, it's risky if they're putting down 40%, it's risky if the value drops below 60% because they've got cash in the game. They're not, gonna, they're not going to leave and walk away from you know, $400,000. They're gonna hang in with that property and do what they can or their parents will help them because the parents are usually the ones who are putting up part of that. Okay, so is there a risk? Sure, there's always risk, but, but I think the alternative, in, in other words, putting the money somewhere else like in a bank or something is even, it's not, it's not attractive to me. It may be attractive to you, and if that's, if that's your situation, that's great. But I would say to you, you're, you may get, uh, um, more cl closer to your purchase price of your home if you're taking back a mortgage because it makes it more attractive to people who may not have uh, you know, all of what they need to get the bank loans at, at the 5% rates. It's just something to consider. Okay, now let's just say that um, the $500,000 exemption wipes out your capital gain. Well, okay, so you have nothing in terms of tax, you're, you, you don't have any problems because you know the $500,000, the, the exemption wiped it out, you sell the property, the proceeds are all yours. So whether you buy, whether you take it to the bank or whether you lend it, it's not gonna matter. Now, but let's just say that your gain is a million dollars and you only get a $500,000 exemption. By taking back a mortgage, uh, what happens is we now have what's called an installment sale. So if you, if you do owe income tax, you pay income tax to the extent that you've received the principal that you're gonna receive overall. So if you've only received half of the principal because you lent the other half, loan the other half to the, to the buyers, then that means that the one half of the capital gain will be paid in the future as you receive principal payments. Of course, you're gonna pay tax on the interest, right? That's just another interest. But you'll, you'll pay a little bit of tax each year if you have a fully amortized loan, and you'll pay the other half of the tax if you have a balloon payment. So you might have a situation where they say, okay, can you carry a loan for us uh, you know, for five years, okay? And what they're saying is, listen, we're hoping in the next five years that the interest rates come back down to the levels that we saw in the, in the last number of years and, and are at the same time, the value of the house will be going up. At the same time, our earning capacity will be going up because we'll be earning more money on a yearly basis. And at that point, they'll be able to more easily refinance the property. So at that point, they'll refinance the property and, uh, and they'll just pay you off and everybody walks away. So you had a sale that took place partly because you made it more attractive to the buyer. I thought you were gonna say their parents might die. Oh, no, 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 no. I hadn't even thought of that, right? Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about selling investment property. So we talked about the cost basis computation for a principal residence. Well, the cost basis computation for a rental property is, is almost identical to that of a principal residence. The, the, the little differences are um, that um, you're depreciating a rental property as opposed to not depreciating a principal residence. So when it comes to closing costs, those are added to the cost basis and, and depreciated over time. 
When you have refi costs, those are added to the cost basis and, and again, depreciate over time. When you have improvements, uh, you know, uh, again, if you have large improvements, those will also be depreciated over time, okay? Now, with regard to repairs, depending on how big the repair is, you may decide and your tax preparer, preparer may decide to just write them off that year, you know, deduct them currently, okay? Yep. Oh, okay, great. Okay, great. Anyway, so depreciation is 25. If, if you do have depreciation you need to recapture in a sale, it's 25% as opposed to the 20%. All right, so um, tax advantage. Okay, now 1031 exchanges. We'll just talk briefly about that. 1031 exchanges, it's a way for you to sell your property and defer the gain into a replacement property later on. Okay, now... So what are you replacing? So it's real estate we're dealing with. There's, there's only 1031 exchanges for real estate. So you can, you can trade uh, you know, residential property for commercial, for land, for a long, long-term lease you know, on, on certain properties. Uh, um, the one popular, the other popular way in the last 20 or so years is something called the DST, Delaware Statutory Trust. And it's a way, it's a way for you to uh, defer part of your gain uh, within parameters of that trust and the property that they own. Uh, and it really fits well. And they're, tri they're all triple net leases, so all you do is you get your, your check every month, which is kind of cool. Okay, what is a 1031 exchange not good for? Well, you can't do a 1031 exchange on a principal residence. You can't do it on flips. You can't do it on developments or uh, properties that you have for your, for your you know, uh, vacation homes. And so this is always the big question is, uh, do I exchange or do I just cash out? Okay, and that's with regard to principal residences or uh, you can't exchange residences, but do you just cash out and pay the tax or, or do you go a different direction? And the answer to this is it really depends on your particular situation. Everybody's situation is different. What works for you may not work for another person. So this is where having a good accountant, a good tax preparer who knows the rules and can walk you through the economics, that's where that, that can really help you, okay? So if that ever comes up, that's really what you need to do is talk to that person and have them walk you through, you know, what's good for you. Um, now, you can also do, uh, with exchanges, there's also the opportunity to do your $500,000 exclusion for the sale of a principal residence and a, a do a 1031 exchange. How does that work? So you're living in a property, you've lived in it for a while. If you move out, rent that property out for a couple of years and then sell it, you, because you've lived in it three out of the last five years, you get the half a million dollar exclusion if you're married, 250 if you're single, and at the same time, it qualifies for a 1031 exchange. So you can walk away scot-free and defer most of the gain into the exchange property, walk away with your 250 or 500,000, and it, it, it all works out well. This is usually where a lot of accountants You'll, you'll know right away if they know what, they, what they're doing because a lot of accountants don't quite understand the concept of doing both at the same time, of combining both. So, uh, yeah, so when you do, you get to actually pull your $500,000 out in cash, whereas in a normal exchange, you can't do that. And then you reduce the sale price by the half a million if you're married, 250 if you're single, and you replace the rest of it, okay? Now, we'll, we'll talk briefly about property taxes. And we, again, how are property taxes assessed? When you buy a property, the county assesses that property, ta uh, property generally based on your purchase price, okay? And then they start, you know, you start uh, paying property tax as you go along. Now, let's just say later on you decide that you want to sell your property, but you like the low property tax base that you've had all these years. Well, with, with Prop 19, you're actually able, to, if you're 55 or older, or you're, you're just permanently disabled, or you're a victim of the, the fires or you know, any other natural disaster here in California, 
you're able to take your tax base and move it to any county in California that's under Prop 19. That's the good part of Prop 19. Uh, and, and that's really something that's, that's pretty cool. So you can move, move out, of, out, of the, you know, out of the area, go to a less expensive area, and still you get to take the property tax base. Now, how does that work? So if you replace the property within two years of selling your principal residence, and the property was equal to or less in value than what you sold, then you're able to elect to take the property tax base you had on the first property into the second one, okay? Now, if you decide that you wanna go up in property value, then what happens is you, you can elect to take the base plus add to the base the, the difference of the, what you sold it for and what the new property is. So let's just say you sell a property for two million bucks and you buy one for 2.5. So you're going to add $500,000 to the tax base of the first property, and that's how the county's going to figure out your taxes. How does Prop 13 fit into that? If you, are, if you have a property that still, like I still pay property taxes under Prop 13, with, yeah, we all do. Uh, so even if you bought a property today, you're still under, quote, Prop 13, yeah, we all do. So even if you bought a property today, you're still under, quote, Prop 13, because that starts your that starts your thing. It's still Prop 13 is still alive and well. They haven't. They've tried to chip into it. Prop 19 was part of it. Um, uh, yeah, but not anymore. Not anymore. Uh, my understanding is any you can move to any county, and they have to accept you in terms of the property tax base. For a long time before Prop 19, that wasn't the case. You had to, you had to find a reciprocating account, uh, county. Yeah, sure, through there were like four or five, right, exactly. But now it's part of Prop 19 was that all counties have to, yeah. Yeah, some, there was another, yes, over there. So what she's saying is, we know that the, 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 the spouses each get 250, but what if the kids were also on title? Uh, and maybe the kids and the parents bought the house together, okay? Each person who qualifies on their own gets the $250,000 exclusion. So let's just say, let's go the, the hard way. So you got a, a kid who, who buys a house with the parents and, and takes care of the parents, you know, as they get older and stuff. And then later on, they, they all want to just sell and do something else. Yes, the kid is filing a separate tax return, they get 250. And they'll take, if it's, if it's equal shares, that, that kid will take one third of the purchase price and that's where they determine the, uh, their, their gain or loss. They'll take one third of the cost basis unless that kid did all the improvements that the parents didn't, then they'll take the, those improvements. You're almost keeping a separate spreadsheet for each person who qualifies. And if that kid marries, Guess what? And if the and if that the spouse lives there for two years, they get it too. Can you uh, add them to the title, and then is there a, a quote unquote look back period? You know how sure, sure. Back? Yeah, um, I can't say a hundred percent for sure, but I think what the IRS would say is that if they're on title for two years, they qualify. Because remember, you got two things. One, they lived there two out of the last five years, and two, they're, they're on title at least the last two years. So you can't put them on title and then the next day sell the property. <laughs> oh, is that where you were going? Nah, come on. <laughs> I never thought of that. Well, thank you, Joe. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Um, and, um, and thank you to everyone here for joining us this evening. And again, we'll be here. So um, if you have further questions, you can talk with me, with um, Christy or Philip or Joe. We'll be here for a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you.